Hey, thanks for watching this video. This is one class from the 2022 HVACR Symposium in Claremont, Florida. We have the symposium every year, and so to find out more information kind of upcoming, go to hvacrschool.com slash symposium. Big thanks to our sponsors for this event, which was AccuTools and TrueTech Tools. They're the two title sponsors that made the event possible. In this class, Steve Rogers and Chris Hughes from the Energy Conservatory talk about a basket case house, a house that's got all kinds of issues, how to diagnose it, and how to deal with it. So thanks a lot for being here. Uh, my name is Bill Graber. I'm with the Energy Conservatory. And I'm Steve Rogers, also with the Energy Conservatory. We're going to talk about a basket case house today. You guys, I'm sure, have never dealt with a problem house, right? And so this is built on a real experience of a technician uh, in the Miami area who was dealing with a problem and he is really elevating you know how he analyzes homes and we're going to share what did he learn how did he learn this and how did he do it uh, you know and how is he sort of refining the process he uses when he's got a problem situation where the homeowners can you know is having a real issue and convinced yeah it's the it's the HVAC guy's problem and he is figuring out a process to say well, maybe it's my problem. If it is, I'll fix it. But I'm also going to make sure that if it's not my problem and it's your house, it's not the C system, if there's something else causing your comfort issues, I'm going to develop a quick way to diagnose that and be able to say, not my issue. It's, it's something else, and I can help you still solve the problem, but it's not my issue. So just a quick introduction. I'm the marketing guy. I'm down here, uh, Bill Graber. My, my real name used to be Bruce Wayne, but I changed it. And, and this guy is Steve Rogers. Uh, if you didn't get that joke, that's Captain America's name. So, all right. I didn't want to be Batman, so I changed my name to Bill Graber. Okay. And we're TEC, the Energy Conservatory. We, we make these, these corridors and things that check, uh, check houses. But we also make, like, the uh, true flow grid uh, more aimed at getting airflow right, right. And so the two together are here to say, hey, how do we make houses better? And this has been a mission for over 40 years uh, by the founder. Okay, and so this is really the premise of this presentation, which is, hey, I got a problem house, and what's causing the issue? Is it this thing, or is it this thing? And how many people in here have been in a situation where you've got what you call a problem house, just one that just keeps coming back and you can't get rid of it? Yeah. So we want to be clear. We don't have the answer for that. There isn't one answer for that. What we're trying to share and, and do is start a discussion amongst, frankly, a really, if you're here, you're here because you are elevating your game. And we want to learn from you too. Part of the reason why we're here is to spend time with guys like you is how things like digital true flow happens. Right? So we want to solve real problems, help you guys get paid to do better work. We don't get paid if you guys don't get paid. You guys don't buy our gear unless you're doing well. Okay, so we're not here to be the experts on all of this. We're here to just let's get a conversation going and let's share what Jenry has done because that guy's doing some great work. Okay, and so, yeah, the idea is sometimes new approaches can make solving problems easier. I'll just jump right in. But the last thing I want to talk about before I hand it off to Steve, he's going to step through kind of the science of how did they do this analysis, is this is just a concept because sometimes I think people hear and there's kind of this, you know, a discussion going on in the community. Oh, careful of home performance and building diagnostics. That's a great way to go out of business if you're a contractor because, frankly, you start looking at a lot of data, but you don't get paid. The concept that we have is, but, but hold on. Uh, if you ever work and the homeowner asks you for something that you're not an expert in, do you have a guy for that? If you're not an insulator, but they're looking for an insulator, do you have a guy for that? For geothermal, for... Whatever is not in your lane, do you say, uh, I don't do that, but I, I know a guy I could point you to. That's maybe the way to think about home performance or building performance. You don't need to buy a blower door, but maybe it will be a good idea to know someone who has one. Just in case you get into a situation where you have a problem home you can't get rid of, and you, you test out your system, and then you say, I think it's your house. I could 
you know, you could bring this guy in and it costs about this much if you don't want to own it yourself, right? This is a way to get started is all I'm saying. That's kind of what Jenry Garcia's business is in Miami is he does a lot of work for other HVAC contractors who can't figure out the problem homes like, oh, I got to call Jenry on this one. It's, it's, a, it's a problem house. Yeah. And that way they get to move on because it's not their system. They've done the work they need to do and then they, they hand it off. If, if you look at this and go, man, I don't really know if I want to do this, challenge yourself to say, but who do I know that I could hand off some of my problem houses to because I've checked out my system and it's not my system and I want the homeowner to not think I'm not doing my job, so I want to hand it off. I need to find somebody like that in my area that I can hand it off to. So this is how it starts and then I'm going to let Steve take you through it. But the complaint was a common one in Miami. Hey, it's just too warm everywhere in the house. This house is just not comfortable when it gets hot. It's running all the time and it's not comfortable. And so it's not maintaining a set point. It's going to 80 when I have my set point at 72. I've got very high relative humidity indoors and I can't figure out what's going on. Okay, and so Steve's gonna step you through some of the steps to diagnose that. We're gonna walk you through some steps here and Bill mentioned we wanna start a conversation. Part of the conversation we wanna have is, you know, what, as you look at these different things that we can do, we'll talk about each one of these, we're not going to mandate or suggest that this is the right order they have to happen. Depending on what you find, you might be going in a different order, and that's part of the conversation we want to have. What we want to talk about is what does each one of these diagnostics tell you about a problem house, and what are the next steps if you find out that this is okay or this is not okay. So the first one, you know, you might just do a visual inspection, look for, you know, are there like disconnected duct work in the attic? Um, do you have... Uh, you know, a system that you have a, a line that's freezing, just visual inspections can tell you a lot. Okay, and we'll, yeah, we'll talk through each one of these. So the visual inspection, you know, if you crawl into an attic and you see this, okay, that's a reason a system would, would not be keeping up, right? If you see a big gap in the ductwork, you're losing tons of the, um, of the air out that leak, and that's going to cause the system to not keep up, okay? In this house, uh, the technician did go in the attic and didn't see any obvious duct leaks, so we check that off and say, okay, well, we did that. Uh, visual inspection did not reveal any, any major duct leaks. Next thing you want to do is be checking the airflow. If you've got a system that's way low on airflow, that means you're way low on capacity too. So in this case, the, the technician did check the airflow with the uh, measure quick and with the true flow grid and verify that the airflow was okay. It's within the range that's acceptable. It's not a reason that you'd be slipping eight degrees on a, on a day that's not even uh, a design day. Look at the design review. Okay, so if a system's not keeping up, is it big enough for the house? Only way to know that is to do a load calc. You know, maybe you can look at runtime, but if it's not keeping up, it's gonna be 100%. So load calc is, is a next step. And in this case, technician did the load calc and what I've got here on this bar chart is the, uh, the equipment capacity here. The blue is the sensible capacity, and the orange here is the latent capacity. So as you do your sizing, if you're following the manual S process, you know that you've got to have enough capacity to cover the sensible load and the latent load, or the cooling and the dehumidification. Okay, so the, the technician in this case did the load calc and found out that this is what the house needs. The house needs uh, this much latent and this much sensible. So the system's covering 114%, a little bit more than necessary of the, of the sensible load and just slightly more than the need you need on the latent load. So is this system sized correctly? And the answer is yes, okay. So it's not that the system's not big enough for the house. Load calc was done, load calc says we're okay. So what's going on? The next thing to check, as I mentioned before, was airflow. And I'm, you know, I talked about that out of order, but the airflow was also checked and the airflow was normal. Okay, the airflow is okay. Okay, the next thing that the technician wanted to do here is look at house pressurization. Have any of you ever done a house pressurization test? You know what that is. Okay, we've got a couple of us that have done that. House pressurization test is, is actually turning on the HVAC system and measuring the house pressure with it on compared to with it off, and does it change? 
if the HVAC system is taking all of its air from inside and returning it back to inside, then turning the HVAC system on should not change the pressure in the house. If it changes the pressure in the house, then that means that air is either leaving the duct system to outside or it's getting sucked in from outside, depending on whether you go positive or negative. So let me explain what that test is. Okay, the test is done by you just have the manometer uh, inside the, the main living space and you run the, uh, the tube on the negative side outside. So you're measuring the house pressure on your positive with respect to outside. And you make, take that measurement with the system turned off and you'll get a number. Um, and then you turn the HVAC system on, let it get up to full speed and measure it again. And did it change? If your ductwork is all sealed and your, all the air that leaves the outside is coming back to inside, the pressure shouldn't change. Okay, but in this case, here's what the technician found. With the system off, he measured 0 0.8 pascals, tiny pressure, 0 0.0032 inches of water is how much that is in, in inches of water. And then with the HVAC system on, it jumped from plus 0 0.8 to minus 1.2. So the difference, the amount that it changed was two pascals or 0 0.008 inches of water. Okay, 0 0.008, does that matter? That's a tiny pressure. And we're gonna talk about why that matters and what he found. Okay, so this is what I mean by house depressurization test. This is different from a blower door. You're not using the blower door to pressurize the house. You're actually using the HVAC equipment to see if the house pressure changes. The, the system off pressure, it, it shouldn't necessarily be zero. That's just because of the stack effect. It's the temperature difference between indoors and outdoors will create a pressure that's not zero. Important to recognize when we start talking about wind that on a really windy day, you can't really do this test because the wind might be fluctuating by 10 pascals, are you gonna see a difference of two pascals? Probably not. Okay, so you kinda of have to wait for a calm day to do this test. So this is what's measured, and uh, Jerry, how long did it take you to do this test? Two minutes. two minutes. You got two minutes? Okay, now we're gonna talk about the importance of, of this test and where those two minutes led the technician. Okay, so how's pre pressurization? House is depressurizing by two pascals when the HVC system is on. That's a problem. How big of a problem, we need more information to say, but it's a problem. Okay, so here's what we've measured. Um, if the house goes minus two when the system runs, here's what's happening. The HVC system is pushing 1400 CFM, okay, up through the attic. This system had no return ducts in the attic. The return is just a, a filter on the bottom of the cabinet in the living space. So all the, all the HVAC ductwork is on the supply side that's in the attic. So 1400 CFM leaves the house, goes into the attic, and some amount of it leaks out and some amount of it comes back in. Okay, and we know that because some of the air is not coming back in. This number of air coming back into the house is less than 1,400 because some of it's leaking out and then you know falling out the soffit vents or whatever. Um, and so what that means is that the house is minus two and it has to make up the difference between how much is coming in and how much is going out. And that difference will always get made up by sucking air through all the cracks in the house. Okay, how do we know that the air, the, there's air coming in. Could it be the case that the air is not coming in? Yeah. Exactly, that's exactly right. We know that there's, the, the difference is being made up because the house did not collapse, <laughs> okay? Okay, so, so far uh, we know there's supply duct leakage, but like I said, the technician went in the attic and did not see any major um, problems in the ducts, and we're leaking quite a bit. We'll talk through how you find out how much you're leaking, but we know there's a supply leak, we just don't know where it is. Okay, so uh, next step would be room pressurization. That's an, a very good diagnostic, but in this case, we're not talking about certain rooms being uncomfortable. So that test is really not necessary if the problem is the system's not keeping up even with all the doors open in, in the living space.
we know there's a problem, minus two pascals of depressurization, but um, we don't know how much. So to know how much leakage you have, the next step has to be a blower door a, or a duct blaster test can actually help you find out how many CFM are leaking out of the, um, out of the system. And in this case, the technician did a blower door test, and he measured 3230 CFM, which is 9.4 ACH50. Okay, that's not a very tight house. That's pretty leaky, but it's also pretty typical of this age house in Miami. Okay, so not a good number, um, but not really the reason that the, ho the system is not keeping up, especially because the, the technician in this case, he put this leakage into the manual J calculation, and so the manual J is accounting for this much um, this much leakage under normal conditions, okay? But what Manual J is not accounting for is that the house is depressurized by the system, okay? Manual J can't account for that. Manual J doesn't assume a certain leakiness of, of ducts. Okay, so here's what we've got. We've got uh, an envelope test, 9.4 ACH50, 32... 30 CFM 50, and this can now be used to estimate the duct leakage. If we have a blower door number, and we know the system was depressurized by two pascals, we can actually use this simulation tool that the Energy Conservatory makes called C-Stack, and we can put those numbers into C-Stack, um, and we can estimate how much leakage it takes for a house of a known leakiness. Go ahead, Bill. We're going to do this. Another option to quantify the duct leakage is to use a duct blaster and measure, right? But in this case, Jenry had a blower door available easy, and he did it because he wanted it for his manual J2. So you're going to see a way to say, oh, if I have a blower door and I did that depressurization test, I can use this free tool and still kind of back calculate in the duct leakage from the blower door. This, doesn't, this isn't the only way to do it. But it's sort of a backdoor way to say, I don't need a duct blaster and a blower door necessarily. Yeah, and actually in this case, I would say maybe this is the front door approach. Because if it, a duct blaster test won't tell you how much it's leaking in normal operation. Yeah. And that's important here. Um, okay, so this is what Manual J assumes. If you put in that the house is leaking 3230 CFM 50, and it's a two-story house, on a day... So the, the, what's important here um, is the difference between inside temperature and outside temperature. And in this case, we've set it so it's 20 degrees warmer outside. So this is actually the same as if it's 75 inside and 95 outside, that's a 20 degree difference. That's what we're simulating here. And this simulation tool will tell us, okay, what we expect to see then is we expect to see 102 CFM of air leaking in the top floor approximately, and the same 102 CFM leaking out the bottom floor it also tells us that at the, the bottom floor, we should expect the pressure to be about plus one pascal because of the temperature difference, and about minus one if we were to measure way up at the, at the ceiling of the top floor. And that's pretty close to what the technician measured. You know, the simulation tells us you should be measuring one, technician measured um, 0 0.8. Okay, that's just from the stack effect. That's how much we, we should have, that's how much we've got. So this is what Manual J assumes. Manual J is assuming there's 102 CFM of natural leakage. This number's smaller, much smaller than the blower door number because the blower door number's done at 50 pascals. This is how much leakage you have because of, you know, minus or plus one and minus one pascal, okay? So Manual J assumed there's 102 CFM of leakage, but the real case, if we change this, um, this fan flow and say, okay, this fan flow can simulate what happens if you have duct leakage from the supply that's blowing out. That's going to do the same thing to the house as if you had an exhaust fan blowing out a certain amount of air. So if we know that the pressure changed from by two pascals, in this case we're going from one to minus one, that's a two pascal change, um, in order to get there, we have to change this exhaust. There has to be 384 CFM exhausting out the exhaust fan to cause it to depressurize by two pascals. So that means manual J was assuming 102 CFM of leakage in and out, 
and there's actually 384. Okay, is that a big deal? Okay, let's talk about what that does to the load calculation. We're going to do that next. Okay, so 384 CFM is what's really leaking. 102 is what we assumed in the manual J. Even putting the correct blower door number in, this is what we assumed. Because manual J doesn't know that your supply duct is leaking out the attic. Now let's look at, so there, there's an additional, you know, we assumed 102. We actually are leaking 384, so the difference is 282, right? So that's how much extra leakage that the manual J calc is not accounting for. Let's talk about what that extra 282 is doing to us in the load calc. Okay, so we talked about this diagram before, 1400 CFM goes out. Now we know because we have a blower door and we have the depressurization number, we can say there's 384 CFM leaking out. So that means there's 1,016 coming back in the house. And that's what causes the two Pascal difference between when the equipment's running and when the equipment's not running. Okay, so that means that we know there's 384 CFM coming into the house through the leaks to make up the difference because, as this gentleman pointed out, the walls didn't cave in. So all these leaks add up to 384 coming into the house. So now we're going to take a closer look at that load calculation that we showed you to begin with, and we're going to correct it. We're going to correct it for what's actually happening that Manual J can't take into account. So on the left here is the equipment capacity. So we're going to keep this on the left. I put the you know, outdoor unit here to remind us that this bar is the equipment capacity, and this bar is what the house needs. So this is what the original Manual J uh, calculation assumed, that we had this four-ton system, and that should be adequate for this house. That's where we started. But let's take a closer look now. We're going to look at each side separately and what this leakage to outside does to the capacity. Okay, so we started here with this four-ton system that has latent and sensible capacity, and then we took about a quarter of the air and we blew it outside. Okay, so what do you have? Okay, you have reduced capacity. If you blow a quarter of the air outside, you've only got about three quarters of the capacity that you thought you had. Very simple, right? If the air didn't come back into the house, it didn't cool anything down. It probably cooled the attic down a little bit, but good luck doing that. Um, okay, so we don't have a four-ton system anymore. We have a system that's much closer to a three-ton system because of the air that we lost. Okay, so now let's look at what's happening on the house. Not only did we lose a bunch of capacity, the house sucks. It sucks hot air in. That's what happens when it's depressurized. So we don't have these loads anymore. We actually have these loads. Um, it's the load is increased because we're sucking in more air than we thought we were. So this is a double whammy. Not only do you lose capacity out the attic, but you also add load to the house because you're sucking in hot air. Yes, so sensible went up, but look what happened to the latent. The latent is crazy now. It's like more than doubled. Yeah, and so does that explain having a humidity problem? If you thought you had this much latent to take care of and you actually have this much, that for sure explains a humidity problem. Because of the extra 284 CFM of extra infiltration coming in, our load is now, now we've got a house that should be four ton, but the load's really closer to five. Okay, so instead of, this is what we thought we had. We thought we had the equipment covering over 100% of the latent and 114% of the sensible. We thought we were good, right? Okay, here's what we really have. We are really only covering 41% of the latent load and 74% of the sensible load. So now we look at this chart, Doing, uh, we've adjusted the, the calculations for what the conditions we really have. Does putting a three ton system on a five ton load look more like what's gonna happen, that you're gonna slip by eight degrees on a warm afternoon? This now explains what we're seeing. That's what we really have. And again, 
Manual J can't account for this. Jenry came to, to me working with the Energy Conservatory because he's like, well, how do I even know how much this matters? And he gave me the numbers, he sent me the data, and I did manual calculations and spreadsheets to figure out how much extra load we have. Okay, so we're taking a closer look at the loads here. Um, so this is the pie chart that a lot of your load calc so software will give you. We've got all the different uh, loads, you know, windows, we've got uh, the latent gain, internal gains, and so forth. The, because of the infiltration, we, the total load gets about 30% bigger, but most of the pieces of the pie don't really change much. What changes is the infiltration load, which is the yellow at the bottom here, and I've broken it up into the, uh, the sensible load in, uh, in the dark yellow, at uh, the solid yellow, and the striped yellow is the latent load. And we're, what we're seeing here is that this um, wedge in the pie now becomes like almost half of the load is infiltration now because of those additional, you know, 300-ish CFM that's coming in. Okay, so this explains what we're seeing. This is a closer look at, um, at what's going on. Uh, Five-ton system, now we're up to 1750. Uh, and but the same, we're gonna have the same percentage coming out, leaking out, and coming in. That's how the 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 flow is gonna work in the duct. Is that if 25% was leaking, you're gonna have 25% leaking with a bigger system too, if you can get there even. So now we got 480 CFM leaking to outside and 1270 coming back in. So we had a minus two Pascal pressure change before. That's gonna go up to something like minus 2.7, so we're getting closer to a three Pascal depressurization now with the bigger system in. Now, what does this do to the loads? So we explain what's happening. We're sucking more air in from outside. Now we got 480, almost 500 CFM coming in from outside. Okay, so let's look at the loads here. Remember this chart? This is the four ton. This is what we, what we really have with that four ton that's in there. If we swap it out for a five ton, what do you guys think is gonna happen? Gonna cover it? There's gonna be humidity issues, yeah. Okay, you're chasing your tail. Okay, so now we got only slightly better. Before we were covering 41% of the latent load, now we're covering 46%. Is that gonna make a big difference? No, it's still gonna be crazy humid. Okay, and instead of covering 74% of the sensible load, now we're covering 83. It's you know, so it's gonna be maybe, instead of slipping eight degrees, you're gonna slip six. Okay, so putting in the five ton will only help slightly, okay, because of the leak. So the message here is you gotta find the leak and fix the leak um, to, to improve the situation. So bottom line here, we wanna start a conversation about what these tasks are, what should you be measuring to try to get to the bottom of it, and we, I don't think we really know what order is best for these, and it probably depends on the situation, and probably depends on what kind of houses you're dealing with. Okay, but these are some things that you should be measuring and doing to try to get to the bottom of a problem house. <clears throat> so current status of this one is that um, Jenry diagnosed as a supply duct leakage problem, recommended a solution, and an offer was made to the homeowner. I think Jenry's working for another HVAC contractor kind of out of his hands. So we don't know if the homeowner went for this one or not, but it's it's out there. Yeah, there's a question. Does any of this change if it's a zone system with two or three different zones? Do you got to run the test with all the zones open? Do you got to run with zones? Yeah, if it's a zone system, I think um, you definitely would want to run the test with all the zones um, calling for cooling. Um, that kind of tests your worst case. With a zone system, I think you could have a situation where some zones are gonna be worse than others. You know, you probably have dealt with the bonus room zone problem. Everybody had dealt with that problem before? Okay, that problem is almost always a, an infiltration problem. If you do a blower door test on that house, okay, what you're gonna find is that it's probably not too leaky, but all the leakage is into the bonus room. The way that they're built, it's horrible. Um, and so what happens is, so your manual J is gonna say, it's good, it's good, but manual J is gonna assume that the infiltration load is spread equally through the whole house when the reality is it's all in the bonus room. I, I think the other thing to think about on your question might be, what's the common 
setting in the zones for the way they're set up. Meaning if they're complaining about an issue and, and just, you know, again, I don't know what condition you're dealing with, but you could do this test under a lot of different situations. And that simple test that Jenry did, the house depressurization, would tell you when these zones are calling, this is the depressurization. When all the zones are calling, this is the depressurization. There's nothing magical about how you have to adjust the system. Try to hit the common settings the way they're actually operating that are causing the homeowner to go, I hate this. This is not comfortable. Please fix it. Another question. Was there a test in interview with the homeowner to figure out what? Yeah, I'm going to repeat it just so that everyone could hear it. But the question is, what was the situation and how was the interview up front? Was this a real estate transaction or a problem? You know, and, and uh, I think the answer is it was a problem. Yeah, it, my understanding is that the uh, original HVC contractor was not Genry, had replaced a system and uh, found out it wasn't keeping up and had this complaint. So I, I think that's how it went. You could ask Genry, he'll know the details. The thing we're trying to highlight here is if you've got duct leakage to outside, um, you know, you've got like a situation where don't put a tourniquet to stop the bleeding. Like you, you've got some major work to do. Go find that leak and fix it or you're never really going to solve the problem. We're almost done. This is the way, this is a slightly different order. And, and um, you know, we're doing this because you, you'll be able to get these presentation slides later. We don't know the answer. But if you look at this, this is what we believe is closer uh, to what Jenry's doing more often. The minute he got a gauge that said, I can walk into a house, and the first thing I do is house depressurization because I've got a gauge now that's accurate enough. You can do this with a blower door gauge from us or Retrotech. You can do it with a DG8 from us at a pretty low cost. But these super accurate gauges, you can walk into the house and within two minutes know, do, I've got, do I have a dominant duct leakage here? Is my house depressurizing when I turn on the HVAC system? If I do, man, that brings me a whole bunch of insight in two minutes. Okay, so, yep. What's the number that I measure when I say I got to do something? Is it one? One other number? Yeah, and that's in the slide up earlier on. It will, there's a little guy that says when I turn on the system, how much change am I looking for? Yeah, but, but on a calm day. I mean, this is the other thing that I'll tell you. There's no test that's perfect. On a windy day, this test kind of isn't going to bring you much insight. You're going to just be fluctuating. So it's not a perfect every single time it's going to give me the answer. You know, there's a reason why the whole industry doesn't do this. One, they haven't had an accurate cost-effective gauge to do it. But two, it's not always available to you. That's right, reference outside. The short answer is one Pascal. It's just kind of a rule of thumb. Um, but the, the longer answer is one Pascal could still be a problem on a really leaky house. It depends a little bit on how leaky the house is. A tighter house, two Pascals might not be a problem. Will it scale with the number of stories? Uh, sort of. The leakage, you get more leakage from a two-story than a one-story. Um, so, yeah, we, we can make a, a table for you. No. <laughs> no, but um, but the, the leakage with a one-story is not half of a two-story. It's like two-thirds of a two-story, the way the, the math works out. So, you know, this, we don't want to get too commercial, but the idea is this is what changed for Genry. You can do all these tests. If you, if you just want a really accurate gauge, now you can get that for under 600 bucks, and that's blower door style pressure measurement, right? Really super accurate at a price where maybe you go, hey, that's a good price. If you want to do the airflow too, these two work together, and you add about 600 bucks for this. These are expensive. That's why up front we said, don't start here. Find somebody that can do these tests for you in your community so that if you really get stuck and you need this, you've got it. But if you're just getting started and you just want to start to get a feel, start up here because you can get a lot of these tests, house pressurization, room pressurizations, um, and that guide you to what should you be looking for and the system airflow and static pressure. Okay. But like we said, you can do this with a, a DG1000 or a DM32 if you already own this equipment. These gauges support that kind of measurements, right? And then this one is available if, you, if you're just getting started. That's our model. This is how we think about it. You know, you guys are, are moving up. You guys are moving up this pyramid. And if you're not ready to go all the way into this, Add somebody to your team. You know, if you're a contractor, you say, I've got sales guys, I've got install and commission guys, I've got service guys, 
and I at least better know a home performance guy. We know a re we know a really good one. Thanks for watching this video. Again, to find out everything we have going on, you can download the free HVAC School app on Android or on iPhone, or go to HVACRSchool.com. And then specifically up in the top, you'll see events to find out more about upcoming symposiums. Hope to see you there. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.